brothers, we do nothing. He will rule over our families. Is that what you desire? Our inheritance does not fall into his hands. Our brother, the dreamer. His words must be reconciled. If we do this, there could be no chance he comes back. There's no profit in killing him. What price can we fetch for a man like him? Good morning, Building A and Building D. My name is Mark Zeiler, and I am the young adult pastor here at Austin Ridge. I'm responsible for leading the table service, which is our service for young adults, people in their 20s and 30s. Um, we meet at Mercury Hall on Tuesday nights at 7.30, so we would love to connect with you if you're in that demographic. Um, Brad couldn't be here with us today, as you can see, but I am here, and I am glad to be here with you. It's a privilege. There is a, a common question that people have in this world and in this country, and especially with a lot of the things going on right now, I think it's a question on people's hearts. And the question is this, how can God be all-powerful how can God be in charge with all the pain and the suffering in this world if he's supposedly loving and good? A couple weeks ago, my wife and I went with my family to, on vacation to Bastrop, and we were, in, we were at a hotel there, and uh, my niece, who's six years old, named Avery, was there, and we did a lot of swimming in the pool. And when you swim at the pool a lot with a six-year-old, there's a lot of throwing you know, like you're constantly throwing people, throwing her, and she just wants to do it over and over. And in this one day, I'm just kind of throwing her all over the pool. And we end up in the corner of this pool, and uh, there's a bunch of other little kids that are kind of sitting there, swimming and everything. There's also this lady to my right who's kind of chilling with a pina colada, you know, with her back up against the corner, the edge of the pool. And I start asking the kids uh, these questions. I'm like, hey, well, what grades are you guys in? And so my niece, she's like, oh, I'm going into the first grade, and then we got a second grader, then first grade, second grade, third grade. And then they say to me, what grade are you in? And I'm like, I guess I'm in 18th grade, you know? And they're like, oh, wow. You know, and then the lady behind me, she kind of perks up and goes, well, what are you studying? And so I go, oh, well, here we go. And I say, well, <laughs> I'm, in, uh, I'm, I'm currently in seminary. And she looks straight at me in front of the little children. She just says this. She goes, I don't believe in God. And all the little kids' heads, I see them in the corner of my eye. They go like this. <gasps> and they look right at her. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, <laughs> the moment of truth, you know, like these fragile little minds, you know, and they're being exposed to atheism, you know, and I'm here to defend the faith, you know. And so, <laughs> and so I just turn to the lady and I just say, well, do you mind me asking you, um, why, don't, why don't you believe in God? And she just jumps right in and she says, you know, I, don't, I have a hard time believing there's a God because when you look around this world, all the pain, all the suffering, how could he allow all that stuff to happen? And then she tells me a personal story about her brother and how he was abused in jail and all the effects that have happened from that. And uh, I just was sitting there like, this is, this is hard to respond to. And so when she was done, I just said, you know what, that is hard. That is hard. If I were in your shoes, that would be a struggle for me too. And it just kind of like her response to that was she just kind of loosened up a little bit. And then she looked back at me and she goes, well, why do you believe in God? And all the little kids' heads go and they look at me. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I need the Lord. And so, so I just respond to her and the best I could at the moment in the pool, you know, in my bathing suit, I just say... <laughs> I just say to this lady, I just say, you know what? I've faced a lot of suffering and pain in my own life, nothing like your brother. But I will tell you this, I believe in God because I believe he sent his son Jesus here on this earth to not only die for us, but he suffered too. And that God died and that he, he came back from the dead and proved that he was God through that. That's why I believe in God. I just kind of laid it out there in so many words. And then she responded and goes, well, I believe in Jesus. And I'm like, <laughs> like, well, okay. Let me, and I was like, I tried to explain to her in the scriptures how 
Jesus is God. And then um, when it was all done, I turned to my, my niece and I said, Avery. And I was like, you know, got her attention. I was like, what did you think about what that lady said about God? And she gets her, her eyes get real big and she goes, let's go to the water slide. <laughs> and I'm like, man, being a parent to little kids is tough. But it's so important, serving the children's ministry. All right. I want to tell you there are rock-solid arguments to, the, to that question. There are rock-solid philosophical arguments. But I will tell you this. The primary way the Bible responds to that question is through stories. It gives us stories. Stories of real people who encountered suffering and what God was doing and how he was at work in their lives and around their lives. That's the primary way the Bible handles it. And there's something that a story can do that no bullet point, no philosophical argument can do because it puts us in the shoes of other people. And as we enter into this next and final section of Genesis and Joseph takes center stage for the rest of the book, you are going to find that this theme of suffering and God's sovereignty and his plan in our suffering is one of the central themes. And I want to take you there. And what we are going to find this morning is this, that no matter what comes into your experience in life, as God's child. There is nothing that can ever enter your experience as God's child that will not be used for good. It is the Romans 8.28, that insanely powerful promise that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his promise. And we see that promise right here in this book in the Old Testament. Same book, same God, same Jesus. Let me show it to you. Genesis chapter 37. Before I read it to you, I want you to think about something. Have you ever seen a movie where at the beginning of the movie, they kind of show you the ending of where it's going, and then they go back and show you how they got there? There are several of them. Um, I want you to picture Joseph. Joseph in his 30-somethings, the son of Jacob, and at, at 30-something years old, he becomes the right hand of Pharaoh, the chief administrator of all of Egypt. And through the power and the influence that God gives him, he is used by God to save his entire family from a famine. There he is. Just kind of picture that in your mind. Joseph, son of Jacob, dressed up in all the Egyptian garb, right hand of the Pharaoh. How did he get to this point? How did he make it there? What in the world? Let me show you. Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to read the first part and summarize the rest. Verse 1. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father had loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it, to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when, his, but when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Then 
Joseph's brothers who hate him, who can't speak peacefully to him, who are jealous of him, they're out you know, doing their shepherd work out in a place called Shechem. And Jacob sends Joseph to go see his brothers. On his way out there, they randomly decide to go from Shechem to a place called Dothan. As Joseph makes his way to Shechem, he randomly runs in to some random guy who had randomly heard, overheard a conversation that the brothers weren't in Shechem, but they're going to Dothan. So where does Joseph go? He makes his way to Dothan. On his way to Dothan, as you saw in the video, the brothers conspired to kill Joseph. However, Reuben, who was, you know, kind of a good guy in the story, decides, hey, let's not kill Joseph. You know, he protects him from dying. So they don't kill him. Instead, when he arrives, they take his robe, they violently rip it off of him, and then they throw him into, the, into a cistern without any clothes. Then when they're having lunch, Reuben happens to not be there anymore, and a random group of Ishmaelites, a caravan, come strolling by. They decide to sell Joseph to these Ishmaelites. Upon selling Joseph to these Ishmaelites, this Ishmaelite caravan just happens to take him down a journey that leads down the road to becoming the right hand of Pharaoh. In the meantime, they take a goat, they kill it, they take blood, they put it on the robe, they come back to their father Jacob and say, an animal killed um, Joseph, he's dead. Jacob rips his clothes, he's mourning, he's grieving, and here we are. Now what do we have to learn from this amazing story? First thing, God uses suffering to change us. God's one of God's primary means to change us and to make us into the leaders and the men of God and the women of God and the people that he intends for us to be is through the tool of suffering and pain. You notice Joseph when he started. When you read the narrative, I totally believe what Moses is trying to show us through these details is that Joseph was a spoiled brat. He was the object of his father's um, spoiling. He gave him a robe. His brothers hated him. They were jealous of him. They couldn't even speak peacefully to him. And this phrase that he had a bad report, he's a tattletale. He's telling on his brothers. But the phrase, the bad report, in the Hebrew, it gives us nuance that it was at least an exaggeration, if not a lie. He was become a liar, a tattletale. And then on top of that, the dreams. Now God gave him these dreams, and the dreams ended up to be true. But you notice, how did Joseph go about communicating? the dreams. Now, if you've got a bunch of brothers and they all hate you and they can't even speak peacefully to you and you have a dream about them bowing down to you and then you go and you just kind of lay it out before them, you're either totally cruel or you're just totally unaware of how you come across to other people. Moses is showing us that Joseph, any way you shake it, he's on the way to becoming a narcissistic, prideful, potentially tyrannical leader. And what does God do to shake that out of him? It's not a classroom. It's not necessarily a seminar or even a conference. It is a pit of suffering. It is a cistern which will lead to 14 years as a slave and a prisoner. 14 years of suffering, wondering what in the world is going on with my life. I want to take you back to a movie. You may have heard of it. It's called Karate Kid. In the movie Karate Kid, you have a certain character, Mr. Miyagi. You guys remember Mr. Miyagi? What's the story here? Well, this kid named Daniel, he comes from New Jersey. And so he comes to California, and there he is in California, Daniel. And Daniel starts to get bullied by a bunch of blonde Californians who are in this karate dojo called the Cobra Kai. You know, that's your first mistake. You know, you don't mess with people in the Cobra Kai. And so Daniel, back in the 80s, when you get bullied, you don't go to the counselor you learn karate. And so, <laughs> and so what does Daniel do? He learns that his, uh, his, the facilities guy at his apartment just happens to be Mr. Miyagi, who is this karate like master. And so he begs Mr. Miyagi, hey, train me how to fight. Train me to be a karate master. And what does Mr. Miyagi do? Remember what happens? The first day of training, he pulls out a bucket of water with a sponge, and somehow Mr. Miyagi has all these amazing cars. Like this whole line of really, I don't know how that happened, but he has all these fancy cars. And he's like, I want you to wash all my cars. And Daniel's like, what? And then 
He has them, you know, the classic line, wax on, wax off. He has them wax all of his cars. He spends the whole day doing all this apparent meaningless work. And then what does he do? The next day, Daniel shows up. He's all right, maybe this is where we're really going to get down to business. And what does he do? I want you to sand this floor, this whole huge deck in his backyard. Sand the floor. And Daniel's like, what? And so he's sanding the floor all day long. The next day he comes in, paint the fence. Shows him how to paint the fence. So there he is painting the fence. By the end of the week, Daniel has had it. He's had it. And he comes in. He's like, Mr. Miyagi, what are you doing to me? What is this purpose? What's the purpose of all this? And he's even cussing him out. And then, Dan, you know, Mr. Miyagi turns to Daniel. And he's like, Daniel, son. <laughs> and Daniel's like, what? He's like, look me in the eye. And then he goes, show me. Wax the car. Or wax on, you know. And so Daniel's like, okay. And he shows him wax on. And he goes, show me sand the floor. And so he, he starts sanding the floor. He goes, show me paint the fence. And so he goes to paint the fence. And then Mr. Miyagi steps back. And he just goes, ah. And he does this like Japanese yell. And he goes to punch him. And Daniel's like, whoa. And he blocks the punch. And then he goes to punch him again. He blocks the punch again. And the lights are starting to come on. And then, Dan and then Mr. Miyagi goes to kick him. And he's like, you know, paint the fence. And he, he blocks the kick. And then he realizes the whole time that Mr. Miyagi has been carefully administrating this whole process of developing him in to a karate master. And he didn't even know it. You see, what the point is, Mr. Miyagi, God is the true and better Mr. Miyagi in your life. <laughs> You run into things all the time, and you're like, what in the world is this all about? What is the purpose of this? The minute things, the traffic, the this, the daily like rubbing and you know, against other people and just getting mad and angry and being disrespected, all, all this kind of stuff, you know, hurtful words, whatever. And then there's the big, huge, like massive things that almost seem to destroy your lives. You know, like just, you know, relational brokenness and marriage and just the hard things. And marriage is beautiful and wonderful, but when they're, bro when they're broken or when they're hard, you know, all the things that can be so, like, life-shattering. Death, getting fired from jobs, the loss of life. God, what this passage is showing us, that God is in control of everything. And he is using all the pain and the suffering to make you into something you could never be without suffering. When you look at the New Testament, you'll find in Romans chapter 5, James chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 12, 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter, James, Paul, the writer of Hebrews, big dudes in the faith, they all say the same thing. They say, consider it joy when you face trials. What? Count it joy when you face trials, when you suffer. Endure all things. Endure for the joy set before you. What are, are they saying that we're supposed to be like these masochists who are like, ooh, yeah, pain is fun. No, but it's that in the joy, God takes the pain and the suffering and he uses it to produce endurance, character, hope, patience, the fruit of the Spirit, all the things that we can't get without suffering. And guys, we're, we are standing on a foundation of God's sovereign plan, Romans 8, 28, which says God works all things according, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, especially your suffering, your trials, your losses, your stress, your worry, all of it. What else is this passage showing us? Secondly, that God never loses control. For God to be in control, for God to work all things together for good, he also must be in control of all things. Notice in uh, the verses 12 through 30, when I described all that apparent random happenings, what exactly is Moses getting at when he gives us all these details about how Jacob decides to send Joseph to Shechem to see his brothers, but his brothers happen to go to Dothan? Are these just random accidents? Is it just random that the brothers end up in Dothan, which happens to be a perfect place to bury a body? 
Is it just random that Joseph happens to run in to this random stranger who just happened to overhear that the brothers would be in Dothan? Is it just random that Reuben just happened to be there to prevent Joseph from, get, or from getting killed? Was it just random that Reuben just happened to not be there to be sold to that particular tribe of Ishmaelites who would take him to be the right hand of Pharaoh? And the answer is no. None of it is random. What Moses is getting at by showing us all these details is the conclusion that Joseph makes in Genesis chapter 45 when he says this to his brothers. He says, don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Because God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for yourself a remnant on earth and bring about a great deliverance. It was not you who sent me here, but God. Three times Joseph says, God sent me here. God sent me here. God sent me here. This was God's doing. And what was he doing? He was overruling their evil actions to bring about the saving of many lives. And I want to tell you now, because of Romans chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 1, especially Romans 8 verse 28, that is true for you as God's child. As God's child in a covenant relationship with him through Jesus Christ, there is nothing that can ever enter your experience that God will not use for your good and for the saving of many lives. This truth holds true. This truth holds true for us as well. You guys ever heard of uh, Jack Bauer from the uh, hit show 24? Uh, he saved our country many times, Jack Bauer. Um, he's played by Kiefer Sutherland. And uh, I first watched uh, 24 a couple of years ago, and it, I started with season five of 24. So I started with season five, and it was a good season. So I'm going to go back and watch the first couple seasons. So I go back and I watch season one, season two, season three. In the middle of season three, and I mean all the seasons, almost every episode, Jack, you know, he's this counter-terrorist agent. So he's always like, you know, trying to like get these terrorists and he gets himself in these crazy situations where he's about to get killed. I'll never forget, I remember I was watching season three and he's undercover, right? He's undercover with the Mexican mafia and he's like with his, you know, partner, and they're about to find out. They're like figuring out that they think that he's not undercover, that he's not who he says he is. So they like, they tell Jack, I mean, they tell Jack, if you're for real, shoot your partner right now. Prove to us. So Jack takes his gun and he pulls the trigger and you're like, no way. But it was empty, you know, so he didn't kill him. And so I'm sitting there watching this. And I'm like, Jack is so going to get it. And I'm like stressed out, I'm worried, I'm scared. <laughs> and then what happens? I remembered the truth that there is a season five. <laughs> I'm like, there's a season five. He's going to get through this. He's going to make it. It's going to be okay. And I just want to tell you, I know it's a crazy illustration, but this promise to us. That God works all things together for good. The, what the truth that is told through the story of Joseph is that this truth is your season five. It is your season 10, your season 100, your season 1000, your season forever for all of eternity. That as God's child, you stand on a foundation. I will say it again, that nothing will ever enter your experience that God will not use for your good and for his glory. Nothing ever, all things, he works together for good. I was in, uh, I took a group of kids uh, two years ago to Chicago on a mission trip. And when we were on this mission trip, um, one of the days we spent a whole day um, at this AIDS um, house, housing facility place. It was this house that um, basically housed AIDS patients. And so we did all this work all day. We were cutting the grass, doing lawn work, fixing up stuff in the house. And uh, I was doing the weed eater in the backyard. And uh, I noticed this huge, like, water feature. It had a waterfall and flowers. This beautiful, well-done thing. And I walk, I'm just kind of looking at it. I notice this guy, and he's standing over there, and he's got his, all his uh, skin is covered because he couldn't be exposed by the sun. And I walked over to him. His name was Clay, and we began to talk, and he was very open. Um, and so I just began to ask him some questions. And at one point, I just asked him, Clay, 
do you mind me asking you how you got here? And he said, man, I'd love to tell you. And he said, I was actually born a, uh, a pastor's son. I'm a, I'm a preacher's kid. But I grew up just totally rebellious, just did whatever I wanted. And through some really poor, foolish decisions and life choices, I ended up in jail. And I was abused there. And I, that's, where I, um, that's where I got AIDS, was through that abuse. I mean, just hearing that, I was just like, oh, man, like, I just can't imagine. And, uh, and then he looked at me, and he looked at me with these eyes. And it was like, what steel? I mean, it was just like as serious as a heart attack. And he said to me that day, I will never forget it. He said, Mark, I want to tell you something. I am thankful that God allowed that to happen to me. And I was like, I was thinking to myself, what? You're th- how in the world is that possible? And he began to tell me, man, I would rather die with AIDS if that means having Jesus. And that was part of God's plan for my life. And now I'm here and I found my wife here and God's using me here in people's lives. And he was able to tell me the truth of Romans 5, James 1, to consider it joy when you face trials and suffering of various kinds because you know that the suffering will produce endurance, character, hope. That he received that from the Lord and he said, it is well with my soul. If that's what God has for me, I will take it and I will trust him. Guys, one of the hard things about this whole truth is that our definition of a good life our definition of what is a good life. Because if it says that God works all things together for good, how does God define what good is? You see, for many of us, I know for myself a lot of my life, a good life is what? What is that to you? Is it a certain amount of money? A certain kind of house? That would make life good? A certain amount of material comfort and convenience? Is a good life a certain status at your job, a certain amount of respect, a certain amount of fame, a certain amount of you know, romantic experience? What is a good life to you? Because I want to tell you this, a good life in God's definition is different than ours. It is different. A good life to God. God, God says, my will for your life is this, your sanctification that you become more like Jesus, that you become more of a person of peace and love and joy and kindness and self-control, that you are more of a person who is pure in heart, who's poor in spirit, who mourns for the losses of this life, that you're a peacemaker, that, that, that your heart is more broken and like Jesus' heart. That no matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on, no matter what you know, material things are happening around you, that you're becoming more of a person of peace and love. That is God's will for your life. That was God's will for Joseph's life. Can you imagine Joseph in this pit? I mean, think about Joseph in this pit. He's a part of this family that's supposed to be like the covenant family that will bring about like restoration and rescue for the whole world. And here he is in a pit. But not just this day, but for 14 years. You know he had to be wondering, what is going on? God, what are you up to with my life? The really interesting thing about this story is the cistern that Joseph was thrown into was in a town called Dothan. The only other place in the Bible we see Dothan is is just a wild story. It's this guy, a prophet named Elisha. And Elisha was was a bold, rough dude. And this one day, he's in Dothan. And he's with his servant, and his servant is with him. And they are surrounded by a great Syrian army. And there they are, and and Elisha's uh, servant is shaken in his boots. He's scared, and Elisha says this prayer. It's in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. He says, open his eyes, O Lord, that he may see. And then all of a sudden, boom! The hillside just lights up, and God pulls back the veil to reveal to this servant and to Elisha what is going on behind the scenes. And what do they see? They see angels in flaming chariots just covering the hillside. Can you, I mean, can you imagine seeing that? Like, imagine, what would you give? 
for just one minute to be able to like have God like, maybe I give my hand, I don't know, but to be able to pull back the curtain, just see for one minute like what is going on around us. And like to see God's purposes in our suffering and trials and all the stuff that's, you know, the things that scare us to death. Guys, imagine if you could access this promise every day. Imagine if just every, just once a day, you were able to access this promise in your life that God is at work. He's working all things together for good. That you are his child. That he loves you no matter what. That what he started in you, he will finish. That you have nothing to fear. Man, I think it's possible. This story that I love to remind myself of is a story about a little girl named Henrietta. Henrietta was born in 1890. In 1902, when she was 12 years old, she contracted muscular rheumatism, which affected her eyesight the rest of her life. She struggled with her eyesight, had to wear big, big, thick glasses to see well. But it was through this struggle with her eyesight that God used that weakness, that pain, and that loss to really develop in her a heart for God, to love him, to love people, to serve others. And by the time she was 28, she had written a lot of Christian material for younger kids, and she had kind of developed a vision for ministry to say, hey, and back then this wasn't totally normal, we need to be like investing in the younger generation. We need to invest in kids and teenagers and college students. And she was a really, you know, powerful communicator and a leader. And she opened a, a, a ranch, like a retreat center in the mountains of California called, what was the name of that thing? I forget the name. Home, Forest Home. There it is. Forest Home. A lady came up. I'll tell you that in a minute. But uh, so Forest Home. Three men, three young men who came to this retreat center where they would have like prayer revivals and, and conferences and stuff. Three men that came who were massively influenced by Henrietta's vision for ministry and her life were one, Jim Rayburn, who started Young Life. Two, Bill Bright, who started Campus Crusade for Christ. And Billy Graham, who started being Billy Graham. You think about just those three guys' as influence and that this girl had an influence on them. Now, Bill Bright, his ministry made all its way all over the country, you know, like the others. Um, but one, in one way, it went to Penn State. And there is a guy named Ellis who was a Jewish college student at Penn State in the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ, led him to the Lord. And then he decided this random thing that he was just going to call down the phone book in the directory of the dorm, and he set up a conversation with a random guy named Don, who he shared the gospel with. He wanted to have spiritual conversations with people. He shared Christ. And this guy, Don, received Jesus. He was a uh, weed-smoking fraternity guy, and he became a Christian. And then he met a girl named uh, Nona, and she would have never married him if he hadn't have been a believer. And they got married, and they randomly had three kids, and I am the middle child of Don and Nona. And I love to think about Henrietta, 12 years old, struggling with her eyesight. And that in some way, God used that struggle in just a little girl's life to lead down a chain reaction that would in some way influence me not only being a Christian, but being alive. I wouldn't even be alive. But not only that, like the young life thing went down the line and you know, led, eventually led to my wife. And now she's still disciple some young life leaders. And now to make the circle complete, if we can just arrange a marriage with our daughter-to-be with Billy Graham's great-grandson, <laughs> you know, full, full circle, you know. I don't think they'd be able to afford the dowry, but whatever. <laughs> Guys, I just want to tell you that I want to tell you this. God is in control in your suffering, your loss. It is a part of his plan. Now with with Elisha and his servant, they were able to see what God was up to. Joseph, not for 14 years, which I believe was a part of the salvation, was developing his character to get him to a place where God would use him. Some of us, we won't, there's things that we won't see, we won't know. What do we do? We trust. We trust by faith 
in God's promise that he is in control. And what do we trust? What do we put our faith in exactly? Think about the disciples. Think about these guys. They followed Jesus for three years and saw some amazing things. I'm talking about amazing stuff. Like they saw Jesus turn water into wine. They saw Jesus bring people back from the grave, like raise people from the dead. They saw Jesus take a little bit of fish and bread and turn it into a lot. They saw him do some, they, he made like the religious and the powerful people of his time just look like paper with just a few words. I mean, the guy was just amazing. And then for them to like just have all this hope, like, oh man, like we're going to take over the world. Like this is going to be awesome. And then boom, he's nailed to a cross. And there he is on the cross. Can you imagine what they must have been feeling at that moment? What was in their heart when they're like, no, like, we're missing it. No, we can't. What that must have been like. And then, and then, three days later, for them to be standing in a room and for some of them, for Jesus to, like, walk through the wall and then be standing there but still be physical and to see him. And like he's showing them his wounds, but he's alive and they can hug him. They can feel his face. They can talk to him. He's eating fish and bread. And then imagine like the lights that must have been coming on in their minds of all the stuff that he said. Remember, they're so clueless. I mean, imagine like, oh, yeah, to save your life, you must lose it. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. He died. Now he's back. God turns death into resurrection. To become great, you must lower yourself and serve, like down in the children's ministry. You know, like <laughs> to, to, like, to understand at all, you have to be born again. You know, like that's crazy. Like God turns all of our deaths into resurrections. So we, guys, how do you approach life? Are you approaching life just holding on to what you think is good? I have to have this, God. God, for my life to be good, you've got to give me this. You can't ever take this away. No. Or are you coming to God with your hands open saying, God, you're the Lord. You are, you are God. You know everything. I surrender my life to you. Take my life. Use me. Use me in other people's lives. Use me to help save others, to bring life to this world. And if you must make me suffer, I trust you. Because he will. You might as well say it. Have you ever believed in Jesus? Have you ever looked at the cross and believed? I want to just close with this thought. The verse, Romans 8, 28. Whoever loves God all things work together for good. Whoever's called according to his purposes, this promise is not true for every individual. This promise that God works all things together for good is only true for those who believe in Jesus, who trust in him, who receive him as their Lord, who look at the cross and say, I was so bad, Jesus had to die for me. But he's, he loves me so much that he was glad to die for me. Have you received Jesus? If you have not, today is the day. Receive him into your heart. Call out to him. Trust in him. Christianity is not an escape from suffering. We won't escape it till we die. But it's the only way through it. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are merciful, that you are gracious. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing promise that you work all things together for good. Thank you that we can stand on that in the midst of a painful and broken world. In your name we pray, amen. I want to introduce Don Ellsworth. There's, like I mentioned, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Don is our global missions pastor, and he's going to lead us in a time of, of prayer. The news over these last few weeks has been hard, uh, ranging from the scare with the Ebola virus to the riots going on in Missouri to news of war in Ukraine and even the death of Robin Williams this week kind of hit a, a weird spot in our hearts. 
The news coming out of Iraq is especially troublesome because of the persecution that is going on among our brothers and sisters in Christ in that region. The truth is, is that this type of persecution happens every day all over the world. There is never a week that goes by where I don't receive an email or a news feed giving specific news of the body of Christ being persecuted for their faith. The news coming out of Iraq is hard because especially it's in the news. It's in our faces. We're hearing about it. The Bible is very, very clear when it calls us as believers to weep with those who weep and to mourn with those who mourn and to celebrate with those who celebrate. We need to respond Now, we live in a culture that is very, very doer-oriented. We like to do things, and that's good. And there are things that we do need to do. I would encourage you to prayerfully consider how the Lord would have you financially give uh, to pray specifically or even perhaps correspond with workers in those regions to bring encouragement to them. I would encourage you to take a look at our website. We have an article there that gives some instruction on how you can do that specifically. But we must be driven by what the Scripture says, how we should respond to such a time as this. Paul in 2 Corinthians talks in great lengths about the persecution that he is experiencing, even to the point of death. But yet he writes to the Corinthians and says, don't come here, (laughs) don't necessarily give, but he says, please pray. We must be reminded that this battle, that this tension, that this persecution that is going on is a battle not against flesh and blood ultimately. As Mark said, it is a battle that is going on behind the scenes with evil forces in the spiritual realm of heavenly places. And so church, I am calling you to pray for our brothers and sisters all over the world, and specifically in Iraq, who are going through persecution because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, there are other people that are not of the Christian faith that are still experiencing that same thing, and we must pray for them as well. But I'm asking you and begging you to respond to God's call for the church to pray. And before we go today, I would like to lead us in prayer and just invite you to mourn with me for those who mourn and to take a stand for those who are taking a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are mindful that you are a good God. We are also mindful that we live in a world that is full of evil and hate. And so, God, we come to you today asking on behalf of our brothers and sisters in northern Iraq especially that you would allow them to stand strong. That as Paul said, that he knew that persecution came his way in order to deepen his dependence on you. God, we don't say it tritely, but we say and and pray that you would allow their faith and their dependence to grow in you during this time. Lord, we pray for those who have recanted their faith under pressure, at gunpoint, whatever the case may be. Lord, we pray for mercy and for grace that you would minister to their heart and to their soul. Our minds are reminded of the apostle Peter who denied you three times, but yet you extended that hand of grace and mercy to him. Lord, we pray for those who are persecuting, for the persecutors God, we take your lead through Jesus Christ who prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And so, God, we pray that their hearts and their minds would be open to the truth of the gospel and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for our government and would ask that you would grant them wisdom, that they would be an extension of your truth, of your justice, and your gracious hand, Lord, to be Uh, meet needs where there are needs. God, we pray for us as a church. We confess to you a flurry of various emotions, but God, I pray that we would not feel guilty, but that we would boldly come before your throne and do what is the best thing for us to do, and that is to pray, to acknowledge that this battle is fought in spiritual levels, And so, God, we call out to you as being the mighty God who is in control of all things and would pray that you would intervene, that you would intercede on their behalf. God, I pray that as you raise us to action, that you would inform our minds and our hearts and our hands and our feet as to how we can respond. And we will trust you for these things. We pray your mercy on the situation and thank you for the fact that these people can be considered worthy to be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. 
May all glory and honor be given to you, Jesus, we ask. We pray these things in your name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.